Please say hello to Peter Segal. Thank you. You don't need much. No, no, I'm good. Your um, voice sounds so familiar. It's a little weird, I know. It's a little weird. I usually do a bit when I come on on stage in a place like this about how incredibly disturbing it is to find out what I look like, but <laughs> we're pressed for time, so I'll just say I'm disappointed too. <laughs> so I was raised in the 70s and 80s to believe, I was told, I was taught that marriage was a good idea. Eventually, I figured out that while that may be true for many people, it was not true for me. I figured that out around the 19th year of my marriage. <laughs> Technically, I figured it out around the second year, but you know, sunk costs and all that. So my marriage ended quite spectacularly in around 2013, and I will tell you about all of that. And, the painfulness of the divorce and everything that happened, but this is not a country music concert, so let's move on. <laughs> and I did what a lot of middle-aged guys who've been married for a long time do once they get divorced, and I dated around. Now, as, as you were told, I, I, I run a lot. I even wrote a book about it. And when I do run, I, I tend to do it with the same group of people. I've been doing it for almost 20 years in the suburb of Oak Park. And they're all like me, or like I was, married people with kids living in the suburbs. And they're almost all men. Uh, strangely, they're all named Chris. This is true. Makes it easy to remember their names, although hard to tell them apart. And, and during this period of time when I was dating around, the guys were really interested. And, and many, many miles were spent running up and down the suburbs with me regaling them of my latest stories from dating. They were living vicariously, unlike other ways to entertain themselves that way. It left no record in their browser, so it was great. <laughs> Everybody was cool with it. Now, there is one member of this running group uh, named Paula. Uh, she's the only woman, also uh, uh, you know, a suburban parent, married. Uh, Paula was not that interested <laughs> in these stories, remained silent. So after about a year of this, um, I met a young woman named Mara. And as soon as I met Mara, pretty much all thoughts of anybody else left my mind. And, we very quickly settled down with each other quite happily, and I could tell you about all of that and how that came to be and what that was like, but this isn't an R&B concert either. <laughs> Suffice to say that my dating days were over and I was very happy, and because of that, my male running friends lost all interest. <laughs> Paula, however, became interested. <laughs> now, Paula is here, so I want to be careful when I describe her. Her lack of sentiment or niceties, her general bloody-mindedness, let me just say, she's British. All you need to know. So one day in the spring of 2017, we're out for a run, and as often happens, people split off. Oh, I've run enough, I gotta get home, whatever. And so they split off, and it just so happens that the last two people running as we finish this run were myself and Paula. And almost literally as soon as it was just she and I, she said to me, so what are your intentions towards this young woman? <laughs> That's a quote. And I explained to Paula that, I, in fact, I was very happy with Mara, delighted, in fact, happier than I ever knew I could be. And Paula says, well, you're going to marry her. And I said, well, I have tried that. It really didn't work for me. So I have no particular interest in ever getting married again. I also said to Paula, well, I, I think, though, that Mara, who had never been married, would like to be married. But, I said to Paula, I feel that if this is something that she wants, she should say so. She should tell me that, as opposed to making me understand it or making me guess. Now, whenever I had said that to a guy, they were all like, well, that's very reasonable, absolutely. <laughs> 
Paula said, you've got to be fucking kidding. <laughs> or whatever the polite British version of that is. And Paula explained to me that given the situation that I had described to her, that Mara and I were very happy with each other, uh, and that I very obviously did not ever want to be married, and she pretty obviously did, she was never going to ask me, because what if I said no? Then where is she? So we finished the run, and I, and I, and I thought about that. I thought about it for a while. And in fact, about two months later, now it's June of 2017, it happens again. We're out for a run with a big group, all the Chris's, myself, Paula, the Chris's all vanish. It's Paula and myself, and Paula says, have you been thinking about our conversation? <laughs> again, literally the first thing she says, as soon as we're on. And I said, well, yes, Paula, in fact, I have, and, 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 and I've come to realize that you're, you're right. In fact, as I told Paula, uh, it just so happened that inter in the intervening time, some old friends of Mara's, a couple who had been together for like a decade, broke up because the woman finally said to the man, so what do you think? Are we ever going to get married? And the guy's like, I don't really want to. And she was like, all right. And she broke up with him because, you know, there was no future in it for her. And I told Paul that story. And then Paula said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, you know, I think you're right. I shouldn't make her ask me and I'm extremely fond of her. I, I certainly want to spend the rest of my life with her. And it seems, and I'm just sort of thinking out loud as we're running along, and it seems kind of cruel to say, oh, I would like you to spend your life with me, and oh, by the way, you don't get the one thing you want more than anything. And Paula says, well, great, when are you going to propose? <laughs> and I said, I haven't thought about that? Uh, gosh, I don't know. Uh, well, I said to Paula, it just so happens that later this summer, in August of 2017, we've got this trip planned. We're going to go out to Mara's favorite place on this earth. She told me about it for years. It's called Bandon, Oregon. It's a town on the seaside. She's always wanted to show it to me, and that's where we're going to go. And Paula says, that will be the place to propose. <laughs> that's when you'll do it. And I said, okay. And then she said, well, where are you going to have the wedding? <laughs> and I said, I, uh, I, well, um, Bill Curtis, my colleague, our friend, and his wife, Donna Life Petra, have this beautiful house out in the country, and Mara loves that place, so, you know, that would be, well, great, that's where you'll have the wedding then. It, <laughs> and we finished the run, and Paula said something to the effect, says, well, you know, don't do all of this on my account, she said. So I'm like, well, I, I guess I got to do this. So we start this trip to the Pacific Northwest eventually. We're going to start in San Francisco where Wait Wait was doing a couple of shows. And we got out there. And I apparently hadn't really committed to this course of action yet. Among other things, I had neglected to buy a ring. The first morning we're in San Francisco, Mara wakes up and she says, oh my God, I had the most incredibly strange dream. And I said, what was it? She says, I dreamt you proposed to me. <laughs> she says that, how ridiculous is that? I said, what happened? She says, well, we were at a wait, wait show. And I was in the audience and you called me on stage and you got down on one knee and asked me to marry you and you gave me a ring. And I said, what kind of ring was it? And she looked at me oddly, not for the first and not for the last time, and said, I don't know, and it was a ring, it was a dream, I'm sorry, I didn't notice. She said, I said, well, was it one of those big honking diamond, you know, rings that some people like? She's like, no, and I said, you wouldn't want something like that, and she said, no, and I was like, okay. <laughs> so I, um, told her that my call at the theater was at six o'clock, was at three o'clock when it was really six o'clock and I went out and I found this nice estate jewelry store in downtown San Francisco and I bought this little antique Victorian ring for her and I had it wrapped up and I 
put it in my pocket, then put it in my luggage, and we started our trip. And we started this two-week trip north through Napa and then Mendocino and then on to Shasta and eventually on to Oregon where we visited friends, including, by the way, her mother was there. She showed up for part of this trip. And all this time, I've got this ring in my luggage, and I'm not telling anybody, and I'm not, you know, whatever. It's a secret. It's going to happen. And eventually, we finish our trip in Bandon, Oregon. This is the destination all along, and we get there. And this is Mara's favorite place. And so she's got all these things that she loves to do. Whenever you go to Bandon, Oregon, I'm sure you're like this in your favorite destinations, you got to eat here and you got to have martinis and watch the sunset. And you got to go to this store and you got to go to this other store. You know, you get fudge and you got to get souvenirs. And we do all this stuff. We have a great time. It's now the evening of the second day. And I should say that once again, as I was told later, I have been doing these unusual or weirdly ambivalent things. Like at one point, for example, we were in a, one of the souvenir shops that she likes to stop and, and, and Mara was buying me a sweatshirt that said Band in Oregon. And I said, oh, I should get you something now. She said, well, you give me this whole trip. You don't need me to, you don't need to do anything. I said, no, I'll probably come up with something to give you later. <laughs> Subtle. So now it's the evening of the second day, final day, the moment of truth. And I get out this very nice bottle of wine we had bought in Napa some weeks before, and I pour wine into two motel plastic cups, and we walk down onto the beach. The ring is in my pocket. And we get down to the beach, and we're sipping our wine, looking around, and I say, Mara, I know you love Band in Oregon in general, but what is your favorite spot here? <laughs> Mara says, what are you talking about? And I said, do you like it over there by the water? <laughs> do you prefer it over here by the rocks? What's your preference? And she does this. She takes a sip of wine, and she coughs. <coughs> and she faints dead away to the ground. <laughs> and by fainting dead away, I don't mean, you know, she staggered, she got dizzy for a second. I mean full-on dying swan, graceful collapse to the sand, completely unconscious. Just boom. And at first, I thought it was a gag. Even though Mara, to that time, had never shown an interest in physical comedy. She has a lively wit. Perhaps she had decided to try it. But then I realized that this very nice glass of or cup of wine that we had carefully brought, she had just spilled out from her limp hand onto the sand. So she is lying there on the ground, dead? <laughs> I don't know. And all I could think as I stood there on this beach in Oregon holding a cup of wine with an engagement ring in my pocket was, what am I going to tell Paula? Well, I tried, Paula, but she died. I, it's really not my fault. I, so instead I said, Mara? Mara? At this point, the accounts differ a little bit. Because Mara now says, that what I actually said to her at that moment was Mara? I'm from New Jersey, sometimes I mispronounce her name. Mara? Mara, are you okay? And thus, Mara says, she came, she was just about to walk into the light, into the great beyond. But she turned around and she came back to basically come back to this plane of existence to say, it's Mara, you son of a bitch. 
What actually happened, whatever the reason is, her eyes blinked open, and I'm like, what happened? And she says, I don't know. I was looking at the water. The water, the wave went out, and so did I. Um, later, she told me that um, I had been dropping so many hints that, um, and yet, I mean, I've been dropping all these hints that I was going to propose, but I obviously was never going to do that, <laughs> that it just kind of shorted her out, apparently. <laughs> anyway, I went from thinking that the evening was going to be spent in the morgue to thinking it was going to be spent in the ER, but she sat up and she was fine. You know, we, we walked around, we checked in on her from time to time. She was fine, she didn't feel lightheaded. Everything was okay and we fed some birds and half an hour went by and in fact then I proposed and she said yes. Yay. And then nine months later, we got married at Bill and Donna's house. Thank you. Running for my life, not looking for a wife. I thought I'd wait, wait to date again. But then she came along, so beautiful like this song, and sealed my fate. Fate, it wasn't too late. When you never thought your life could start again. Cause everything you knew before was sink or swim I took her by the hand, Mara fell into the sand And I thought, uh oh, where did she go? Who wanted to sweep her off her feet? Not quite so literally, but then she came to Thankfully, everything I knew before was compromised Never thought I'd ever be so satisfied Hey Paula, just tell me what to do You're a most unusual, unsuspected guru Hey Paula, you're stern and harsh and you are cruel But Paula, Paula, Paula I owe it all to you Talking on a run, hoping she wouldn't bring it up But, well, you know that Paula She cornered me and tried To force me to abide until I gave in She wouldn't get up Working on a marriage can be toil and strife But Paula will drive you crazy till you have a Luminaries, come on up, will you please?